in Citro, our goal is to make people healthier. And we're trying to do that by making better drugs and making them faster and cheaper. One can look at drug development from two perspectives. There's the glass half full perspective, which is this one, which is that in the last 50 years, we've made a big dent in infectious diseases, in cancer, in autoimmune diseases, in genetically inherited diseases. Diseases that once were a life sentence or a, or a life of pain are now, can, are now something that we can possibly manage and sometimes even cure. So that's the glass half full. The glass half empty is this curve, which has come to be called Irum's law. All of us are familiar with Moore's law, which is an exponential increase in productivity. This is an exponential decrease in productivity of pharmaceutical R&D consistently over the last 70 years, and the trend is only continuing. This is obviously unsustainable. Now, why is that? Um, it's because the path to drug development is full of forks in the road, where at each fork there's one path that leads you in the good direction and 99 paths that are going to fail because biology is really complicated. And each of those failed paths costs a lot of money and takes a lot of time, so that eventually, as we go through the drug development process, each approved drug ends up costing us, and the ending ends up bearing on its back the cost of many, many, many failures. Fundamentally, if you think about this, this is a problem of prediction. If we could only make predictions better and not take all these bro broken paths in the road, then perhaps a drug would not cost $2.5 billion to make. So what is the problem that we care most about predicting? There's a number, but the one that's most important is what will an intervention do when I administer it to a human? How do we make such a prediction without the ability to experiment in humans, which is both really challenging and fundamentally immoral in most cases? So the way in which we currently do that is by using a model system, oftentimes a mouse. So mice don't actually get most of the diseases that inflict humans. They don't get Alzheimer's disease. They don't get cardiovascular disease. They don't get schizophrenia. So we create these diseases in a small furry beast with tails and an ear, and we hope that by curing that fake disease, somehow we learn something about humans, and that's why most drugs fail. What we'd really like to do is we'd like to use humans as a model system for humans. So how do we do that, given that we can't actually do experiments in humans? Well, fortunately for us, Mother Nature has made each and every one of us an experiment. Each of our genomes is different in thousands and thousands of different genes. And each of that, and that combination creates a different phenotype for each of us. So can we use Mother Nature's experiments as a way of telling us about the connection between genes and function? Fortunately, the cost of sequencing has been on a Moore's Law curve over the last um, 20 years since the first human genome was sequenced. In fact, the cost, the, the number of human genome sequences is going twice as fast as Moore's Law, so that by 2025 we might have somewhere between 100 million and 2 billion human genomes sequenced. Now, genomes on their own are only useful in so much as one can tie them to clinical traits. And fortunately, here also, there has been a growth in various biobanks, like the UK Biobank with 500,000 people, all of us here in the United States with a million people, with many, many phenotypes that are being measured for each of the people participating in those studies. So now we can put those together and really tie the genetics to the phenotypes, which suggest the causal connection between gene and function. So indeed, over the last um, 10 or so years since, there's been a growth in the number of what's called genome-wide association studies, where different diseases have been tied to individual human traits, disease traits as well as non-disease traits across a multitude of diseases. And so you would think that we would be done because we would now have an understanding of the causal basis of disease and what we can, and then use those genes that are disease-causing as targets. The problem is that there, these diseases are complex. There's many hundreds or even thousands of genes that are often tied to a particular disease. And how do you know which of them to go after when in aggregate each of them only has a small effect, at least at the population level? So this is a challenging problem. 
What we're doing at Incitro is we're using another type of data to supplement human genetics. And that is based on a new revolution that's come about, which is that of high content biological data, which allows us to get much closer to the causal biology. So here we are leveraging an amazing bag of tools that smart people have been developing over the past decade or so. First of all, there's the ability to create disease-relevant biological systems by taking cells, skin cells, from patients and controls, reverting them to what's called pluripotent stem cell status, and then we can create from that, from the skin of any person, neurons from that person, or hepatocytes, or cardiomyocytes, or multiple different types of cells that really allow us to understand what the disease looks like in those cells compared to healthy people. We can furthermore perturb those cells using genome engineering techniques such as CRISPR to create even more disease-causing genes or fewer. And then finally, we can phenotype those cells, measuring them in many, many different ways to understand what sick cells look like relative to healthy cells. And finally, by using automation and microfluidics, that allows us to do this at unprecedented scale, creating masses, mountains of data. So let me explain what that abstract concept looks like. This is just a beautiful case study of a region in chromosome 16 that for whatever reason is mutated in a number of individuals. And it turns out that when it's deleted in people, it causes autism with probability 75%. And when it's duplicated, it causes schizophrenia with probability 40%. But we don't know why, because there's 25 genes in the region. We don't know which of them is responsible or how it does that. So a couple years ago, um, they took samples, skin samples, from these patients, from both types, reverted them to stem cell status, differentiated them into neurons, and they looked at them under the microscope, and what you see is this. You see that in the autism patients, there's an excess of synapses, and in the schizophrenia patients, in the duplication patients, there is a depletion of synapses. That is a phenotype to which we can now screen and see if there's interventions that revert that phenotype and bring the, the patient back to healthy, hopefully. So that's all great, but it gives us data that looks like this. Mountains, hundreds of terabytes of data that looks like this. People can sift through this and make sense of it. So that's where we begin to deploy machine learning. Now, um, Peter talked about machine learning in his presentation, and I think the progress here is just mind-blowing, even to me, who's been working in this space for um, over 20 years. Back in 2005, when I was working in computer vision, if you were to show this image to a, a computer and ask it, is there a bear in this image, it would say, I don't know. 2012, there was more data, better algorithms, and the label to this image would be probably something like wolf. Now, there's no wolf in this image, but it's a wolfy looking bear, so, you know, maybe. Um, 2014, only two years later, the actual label, a brown bear is swimming in the water. This is not a phrase. Now, the bear isn't actually in the water, but it's a pretty darn good label. 2017, two brown bears sitting on top of rocks. Today, computers can label images, even natural images, better than people, despite the fact that we're trained to perform this task from birth. So imagine what would happen if we were to take this and apply this to cellular images. So one important thing is that you get from machine learning is not only classifications, you get some insight into the similarity of the domain. So the machine learning takes these images in this case and puts them in what's called a low dimensional manifold um, in which the adjacency in the manifold corresponds to semantic similarity. So these two images of trucks which are very, diff very different from each other, very distant in pixel space, are actually close to each other on the manifold. They have to be because the computer has to label them the same way. Other images in other classes, like cars and tractors, are not in the same class, but they have some features in common, so they will be in the same general area, whereas images of cats and dogs and turtles will be in a completely different part of the space. So now, imagine that we were to do this with cells. This is what we call the cellular phenotypic manifold, in which we place these images of cells on a manifold using machine learning. And now you can start to identify clusters of patients that might present clinically in the same way, but molecularly look very distinct to each other. 
And furthermore, we can screen from in, for interventions that revert the yellow sick cluster to the blue healthy cluster, um, basically looking for drugs that work at the cellular level and hopefully will then also work for clinical outcomes. So effectively, um, what we've done is to base, put this infrastructure in place, and that required a tremendous amount of effort. It required a biodata factory that produces biological data at unprecedented scale. We've produced 95 terabytes just in the last six months, and that's while well, we were still working out the kinks. That speed is only accelerating. We need the help of our friends at AWS to give us compute infrastructure that can handle these terabytes of data, of images that are 20,000 by 80,000 big. And we need to then define, design machine learning algorithms that are able to do this kind of classification to look at cells and figure out genetically what they look like. So this is part of our early result. It's just baby steps for now, but it's already performing much better than the state of the art in identifying these um, these interventions. And importantly, while building this infrastructure was really complicated, so the first time we did this took three months, the second time took two days, and we're only accelerating that uh, with the infrastructure now in place. So what we're building is what we call the in situ human platform, and it's an integrated closed loop between biological data generation at unprecedented scale using robotics and microfluidics and all these tools like CRISPR and iPS cells and so on, together with cutting edge machine learning. And it's not two separate things. It's a closed feedback loop where the machine learning helps design the experiment and continually learns from it and feeds that back um, to the biological experiment with an integrated team of biologists and machine learning people and engineers working hand in hand as a single team. Now, we think this is really important, not only in itself, but because we think it's part of the next wave of science. If you look back at the history of science, you can see that it pursued, precedes an epochs, where at a certain period of time, one discipline makes a huge amount of progress in a relatively short time frame because of a new way of looking at things or a new invention. In the 1870s, that epoch, that science was chemistry. Uh, where we moved away from alchemy and turning lead into gold to understanding the periodic table. In the early 1900s, that science was physics, where we understood the connection between matter and energy and between space and time. In the 1950s, that science was computing, where the power of silicone chips allowed us to perform computations that up until that point only people had been able to do, or even not them. And then, in the 1990s, there was an interesting bifurcation. Two disciplines suddenly took off. One is the discipline of data science or machine learning, where, um, which is related to computing but different because it also involves statistics and optimization. And the other discipline was what you might call quantitative biology, where tools like um, super-resolution microscopes and sequencing and microarrays, uh, which measure transcriptional profiles, all of a sudden allowed us to measure biology quantitatively and at scale. And those two disciplines basically proceeded in parallel without much interaction until now. I think the next epoch of science, the one that's coming up in the 2020s, is what you might call digital biology where we have the opportunity to measure biology at unprecedented fidelity and scale, to use machine learning to interpret what we're seeing, and then to use that insight to then go back and re-engineer biology to do something that is different from what it would normally otherwise do. I think that discipline, digital biology, is going to transform multiple parts of the world that we live in and is going to really um, help us change human health. And we look forward to doing that. Thank you very much. <laughs>